Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel Marginal Revolution. So let's just get started with our new chapter and that is chapter number 5. The name is Keynesian System, the Role of Aggregate Demand. So the chapter itself broadly explains what this entire chapter is going to be all about. So Keynesian System is associated with the role of aggregate demand just like the classical system was associated with the role of classical aggregate supply curve that is aggregate supply only all right so the first few pages carry a broad understanding about how come there was a downfall or rather a blow to the classical system of economics what exactly happened that led to the emergence of keynesian economics so i'll try to explain quickly what exactly happened just to have a brief understanding because there is no point in just mechanically jumping into the <laughs> aggregate demand and classical sorry keynesian model without to be knowing exactly what happened that led to the emergence of the macroeconomics so definitely the term was given by the karl marx but keynes was something who brought this entire subject into prominence so definitely in the year 2000 and not 2000 and in the year 1930 there was a great depression because there was very high level of unemployment that was something very very strange because classical notion is that there can never be any sort of unemployment in the economy people's gonna always be at their full employment level of equilibrium people who want work they're gonna be getting work choice is always between working at factory a or working at factory b there is no such thing at working or not working so definitely the events of 1930 would not as per the classical notion especially in the great britain there was a very high level of unemployment and the classical explanation of this very unemployment was that that laborers they don't have any knowledge they ought to be given more skills they ought to be educated so that they don't end up making bad decisions they don't end up making sub-optimal decisions so this was the classical notion and further the solution that they gave to the various governments were for example to the usa president who were the solution was that let's just raise the taxes because income had fallen definitely people were unemployed they were not getting paid so how come they're gonna be paying taxes so let's just increase the rate of tax so that the tax revenue that has fallen that can be compensated because we always need to have a balanced budget into the system and also any keen solution was that definitely we will study in detail what the keen solution was just now i am giving you a brief background because author has also explained this thing in the first few two three pages so we are sticking to the chronology of this chapter so keen solution was definitely that the cause of this great depression was steep decline in aggregate demand we have already studied that aggregate demand comprises of consumption demand government spending and the private investment demand and keynes was of the view that this investment demand that is a private investment demand because private people all interested in their own profit so this was quite erratic quite unstable so private investment demand had fallen steeply so government had to intervene in order to infuse the government spending into the economy so as to aggregate demand can be compensated aggregate demand can be raised the fall in the private investment demand can be compensated by rise in the government investment government component of demand so that aggregate demand goes up this is it okay i know i'm going fast because this is not very very tough or very important we will proceed very smoothly very slowly when it comes to the actual model because it's really <laughs> sort of very normal things that author has explained either way you will be needing to read Freud and things gonna get more clear okay so Keynes solution was this and classical notion was different and further why classicals were of the view that Keynes idea is flawed because in the classical economics there is no such thing as aggregate demand and also there can never be any thing that gonna impact the aggregate supply even if you increase or decrease the tax rate it's even if you increase the government spending there it's gonna have no impact on the aggregate demand and further on to the aggregate supply why so we have dealt with this thing right before this very lecture when we finished reading chapter number four all right so we know why is it and if you don't know then it's good to watch those video lectures or read chapter number four thoroughly all right so 
this is it so we saw that classical system failed us when it comes a real test why classical system kept on working for 200 plus year because we know the adam smith paper wealth of nation in their 1776 launched the classical economics into our system and it kept on working for 200 plus years because there was no any event that was to test the classical system and the moment a test came classicals failed us and then there onwards we saw the emergence of the keynesian system all right so i'll just be reading the highlight portion here just as to be sure that i haven't missed anything so classicals were of the view that if public works projects were financed so definitely how government gonna be infusing the money government gonna undertaking spending in terms of carrying out developmental projects but the classical of the view that it's gonna have no impact onto the output and we know why i mean this is quite quite obvious now further what they suggested to the president of usa was a large tax increase so that increasing tax rate was to balance the federal budget in the wake of falling tax revenue as income had declined we've already studied this thing further would not increase in taxes or the cut in government spending lower the aggregate demand output and employment definitely no in the classical system because output and employment they are all supply determined all right further what exactly keynes said it was that definitely we are all saying that classical economics is full of certain contradictions it is not something that is worthy of any real substance but we can just keep on criticizing it we have to provide a valid contradiction here we have to put the things on paper on the perspective okay we can just criticize the classical economics in a very generic sense so what exactly was the drawback into the classical system so keen stated that classical system does not have any explicit theory of aggregate demand they are determining the prices they are determining the aggregate level of output without even considering that there can be anything with the name aggregate demand at all so he believed that keynes believed that flaw to be the lack of explicit theory of the aggregate demand for output and hence of the role of aggregate demand in determining the output and employment so definitely there was no concept of aggregate demand in the classical system which is again very very unnatural we just have started keeping taking this thing in a very obvious manner that this is so so obvious that there is definitely something called aggregate demand but this was not the case up till to up till 1930 there was just classical economics and there was just supply determining nature of output and employment that's it so keynes basically encapsulated his idea that is the contradiction of classical in a very logical concrete manner by highlighting that the classical system did not acknowledge the presence of aggregate demand in the economy this was the criticism all right friends so this was just to make a build a contextual base that yes there was something called mercantile capitalism then we came on to classical system mercantile capitalism was all about state intervention active state intervention because trade was a zero sum game either we're gonna lose or we're gonna gain so in order to gain we just have let we have to let state intervene so that we can extract maximum benefit and this was what exactly great britain did back then when he was it was extensively undergoing colonization imperialistic tendencies were there then came the concept of classical economics that is adam smith that no we don't really need state intervention because trade is a advantageous people who have absolute advantage in one thing they're gonna export the commodity and the one who has absolute advantage in the different commodity you're gonna expect it gonna export different commodity so we don't really need state to intervene in terms of international relation i have explained this thing not international relation sorry in terms of international trade i have explained this thing but in terms of the output in employment also we know that everything is self adjusting there are self adjusting tendencies into the system so this is the very reason we don't really need state intervention all right but then came the great depression of 1930 where we saw that despite there being no state intervention still there was huge huge unemployment and the classical ideas were failing so come keynesian system and now we're going to go into the details of the keynesian economics fine so we have a key simple keynesian model 
conditions for equilibrium output simple keynesian model means we gonna be undertaking certain assumptions we know that real economy works on very different different variables but to build a model we have to ascertain certain assumptions so as to simplify the situation so what all are the assumptions here number one is the basic understanding that equilibrium position is one where we have aggregate supply equal to aggregate demand this is quite obvious and we otherwise also know this thing even if we are not student of economics all right we will see individual components but let's just talk about certain basic details here to simplify the model we have assumed that we are just working in a closed economy closed economy means there is no international trade there is no export no import so we know that what is output output is gdp okay i really am not going to explain what gdp is because because if i go and explain these tiny tiny details now they're going to be lot of divergence from what we're already studying now as a har ek cheez pe ek alag topic ban sakta har ek चीज पे दस मिनट का वीडियो बन सकता है राइट सो वी गोना बी एटलीस्ट आई हैव टू मेक सर्टन एग्जाम्पन्स दैट वी ऑलरेडी नो वट दीज टाइनी डिटेल्स आर राइट आफ्टर ऑल वी आर स्टार्टिंग मैक्रो इकोनॉमिक्स एंड या सो जी डी पी इज डेफिनेटली द मार्केट वैल्यू ऑफ गुड्स एंड सर्विसेज प्रोड्यूस्ड विद इन द डोमेस्टिक टेरिटरी ऑफ ए नेशन दैट टू इन ए गिवन ईयर आई मीन जनरली इट्स अ पीरियड एंड वी कंसिडर दैट पीरियड टू बी period to be a year okay so if there is no international trade then our gdp will be gnp because instead of domestic it could be national also there either way there are no exports or imports so does not mean does not make any difference if we are writing t or writing n so gdp becomes gnp further there is no depreciation so we know that gross minus depreciation we get net so if there is no depreciation then there is no difference between gdp and nnp so we get net national product further we are not including the indirect business taxes so we are if you are not taking into consideration the taxes and subsidies then definitely nnp at factor cost we arrive at and that becomes our national income all right if you don't know the thing then i would say read any basic basic book it could be ncert or 12th standard but yeah this is it friends either way you have lot many complicated things to be understood so i really can't go on explaining these tiny details and i am very much sure we already know what these things are okay so let's just get into the model right away author further has assume that aggregate price level is fixed this is a quite obvious assumption that we we have to make the price level fixed right we we can make the prices fluctuate so any changes that we are talking in the variables that changes will be in the real sense because prices are constant quite obvious quite simple all right now intuitively we know that whatever income we are earning it could either be consumed it could either be taxed or saved okay so if, if we are rendering services we're going to get paid and we're going to be using that payment into consumption or we're going to use it to pay tax or we're going to save it this is how the money will be spent and this is what author has written output or national income would either be consumed saved or paid into taxes so we got two equations here number one this that we have in the equilibrium system output equal to consumption plus investment plus government spending we'll see what these individual components are but right now just memorize this logic so if y is equal to c plus i plus g if y is equal to c plus s plus t it simply means that y can be equal to i mean these two can also be equal to that like it's like a is equal to b and b is equal to c then a is also equal to c right so c plus s plus t is equal to output which is equal to c plus i plus g now we need to understand one more thing here and that is the concept of realized investment so realized investment is basically the investment that has been undertaken this is it whenever we write i that by default means a realized investment and we have to write r specifically here in order to differentiate the realized investment from desired investment and we will see what desired investment is or we can see it right now also so this is important just to 
make things clear i will be taking an example this is not very correct example but just to have an understanding let's say that we want something like we want what we want a laptop so this is our demand because we this is a desired investment this is not logically correct but either way it will help you understanding what's the difference between realized investment and the desired investment so desired means as such it's an english word it means we need something right so we need a laptop we want a laptop that is our desired investment and because we want it that adds to the aggregate demand simple but if we actually go into buying it if we have actually undertaken that purchase then it becomes our realized investment because we have actually bought it that good has actually been supplied to us and it can only be supplied if it was produced also so we can say that realized investment in something which becomes a part of aggregate supply and desired investment is something which becomes part of aggregate demand and when we are on to the equilibrium level realized investment will be equal to desired investment that is aggregate demand will be equal to aggregate supply because in both aggregate demand and aggregate supply c and g components are there only difference is ir which is a part of aggregate supply and id which is part of aggregate demand so divergence between realized investment and desired investment is something that creates this equilibrium all right further this is the equation and i have already explained how come we arrived at here c is there c is there it gets cancelled out s is there no s is not there what is there then c plus c only c gets cancelled out we are left with s plus t and i plus g so this is second way of writing the equilibrium it is quite simple little bit of maths is there c gets cancelled out and we are left with s plus t on to our left side and i plus g on to our right side and intuitively also it's obvious because savings are something that are leakages from the income so suppose we have earning rupees 100 and instead of buying the goods for worth rupees 100 we are use, using 50% of money to save it so savings are something which are leakages from the income again taxes are also leakages and investment government spending are injections so leakages into injections we got equilibrium which is the second way of expressing this very equation all right now the third way we can also write that this is the aggregate supply consumption plus realized investment plus government spending which will be equal to aggregate demand and aggregate demand is what consumption plus desired investment plus government spending this is it now c gets cancelled out g gets cancelled out and we are left with ir and i so in the equilibrium level realized investment will be equal to investment this is it further again author has just put them into one place the entire equation that we have talked about so yes this is it we already know what this is okay so now this is a circular flow of income and output i am not assuming that we are talking about the two sector economy only because we are already <laughs> into good portion of economics right we are not student of 12th class that we going to be needing to understand in very step by step manner so let's just assume that all sectors are there we have household sector we have business sector financial markets government sector we have all sectors incorporated into our model so definitely households are random factors of assist the business sector and business sector produces the output and it pays the households it pays what wages interest rent right and yeah so now how this circular flow is completed so definitely households whatever income they are earning from rendering their services to business sector households gonna either use that money to consume goods again consumption is the demand for the very output that the business sector has produced so one cycle is here or it gonna save some portion of the money into the banks into the financial markets all right 
or it's gonna pay some portion of that very income to the government in the form of taxes quite simple now consumption portion has given rise to the demand for the goods and services that the business sector has produced but saving and taxes they are leakages they have not generated the demand for the goods and services but how this leakage is gonna be converted into injections through the intervention of financial markets and government sector so savings government financial sectors gonna supply this very saving to the business sector and business sector gonna borrow that money and undertake investment so the saving component also gets converted into investment so leakages gets converted into injection this very cycle is also complete further taxes are there which is paid to the government but government gonna definitely use that very taxes for its spending for its developmental program so whatever spending government's gonna undertake it will definitely cause a demand for the very goods and services that the business sector has produced so the taxes which are the leakages from the income again gets converted into the injections in the form of government spending that raise the demand for the very goods and services that the business sector has produced so this is how our entire circular flow of income and output is complete so let's just read the highlighted portion so these are all flow variables we know what flow and stock variables are flow variables mean something that is measured over a period of time right and if you don't know what these terms are then please read chapter not chapter book 12th macro 12th chapter so sorry 12th class economics book ncrt you need to read that it's gonna be making the basics clear all right for the payment for factor services we have already dealt with this thing so factor services are def definitely supplied by the household sector and further tax flow is in the form of net taxes so net taxes means taxes minus subsidies or any transfer payment so households earn income and out of that income some portion is paid to the government in the form of taxes but at the same time government also provides subsidies some social social security to the households and these are transfer payments what exactly are transfer payments the payments for which households are not paying anything they are not rendering any services they are sort of free transfers from the government for example subsidies etc so taxes is net format that is taxes minus transfer payments all right further yes the level of output will be at equilibrium if this directly generated demand when added to desired expenditure investment expenditure of the firms and government spending produces a total demand equal to y so this again is simple definitely we have to have realized investment equal to desired investment if we want equilibrium in the economy and we have already explained this thing that why this has to be the case so again savings plus taxes are leakages and this has to be balanced by injections which are i plus g amount of income households do not spend on output is just equal to the amount the other two sectors wish to buy this is it we know what this is that consumption is direct demand of the households but the income that they do not spend on buying output that is their using that income to pay taxes or to save that money but definitely through financial market and through the government they also get converted into the injection into the government spending and into the investment and these are part of the injection so leakages into injections we get the equilibrium back to level all right so now this is important that the investment demand of the private sector we're talking about is definitely into the form of plant and equipment plus inventory investment what is inventory it's the stock of the goods and services and plant and equipment is definitely plant and equipment so what author has stated that largely broadly plant and equipment they remain same it's just the inventory investment that worries because stock is something that can be worried right so inventory investment that desired and realized totals may differ so realized investment is definitely something the output which has already been undertaken so goods has already been produced because it's a realized investment we're talking about but desired investment is something that business entrepreneur wants to undertake it becomes it's part of aggregate demand so when we are saying that realized investment is more than the 
desired investment it simply means that there is more inventory in hand there is more actual aggregate supply than the aggregate demand and when this is the case then definitely what will happen since aggregate supply is more than the aggregate demand we're gonna be having accumulation of unintended inventory accumulation means accumulation means accumulation like what is what can be a different term of accumulation is like aggregation of inventory that to unintended that is business entrepreneurs didn't want to keep a stock of this inventory it just got accumulated because realized investment turns out to be more than the desired investment so what's going to happen so aggregate supply is more than the aggregate demand so entrepreneurs gonna cut short onto their aggregate supply they're gonna reduce the stock of inventory because it's already been accumulated and that too unintended so they're gonna sell off this very stock and we're gonna be seeing the realized investment going down which again gonna come to the level of desired investment all right further the opposite condition could be when the realized investment is less than the actual investment or desired investment i mean so sorry when realized investment is less than the desired investment so desired investment is part of aggregate demand entrepreneur wants to undertake more investment but they haven't undertaken so aggregate demand is more than the aggregate supply we're gonna be see unintended that is unwanted inventory shortfall so what will happen because inventory shortfall is there so they will increase the level of production and if level of production has gone up it means the desired realized investment will go up so aggregate supply will go up so we'll see the equilibrium going back to the normal level again we'll see aggregate supply being equal to aggregate demand again so this is how this entire thing is adjusted the equilibrium point i is equal to ir is the level of production that after all sales are made leaves inventory investment at the level of desired firms so really a lot of pages has been dedicated to explain this tiny point the broad underlying idea is simple that realized investment has to be equal to desired investment and if these two worries we're gonna have disequilibrium because realized investment is a part of aggregate supply and desired investment is a part of aggregate demand so whenever aggregate supply is more than the aggregate demand business entrepreneurs gonna cut short on its inventory because there is already unintended inventory accumulation and we'll see aggregate supply falling down and becoming equal to aggregate demand the other way around is true when we have the opposite case all right now we will see the components of aggregate demand which are again very very important and yes i mean very high utility this chapter carries because because of many things because very questions are asked from this chapter in a direct way in an indirect way also so we know that aggregate demand comprises of consumption plus investment plus government spending now we'll see we'll look into individual components into the detailed manner so what is the consumption function consumption function is the keynesian relationship between income and consumption so definitely we are earning money suppose 100 rupees and we're gonna be using something out of that 100 if not the entire amount to consume to purchase goods and services so let's say out of 100 we are using rupees 80 to consume goods then 80 is our consumption demand definitely further keen stated that income was a dominant factor determining consumption definitely there are many other factors for example as an individual what are our inclinations are what are the prices in the economy what are our wealth so all these things are there but we have to again undertake certain assumptions and keen stated that broadly largely income is a dominant factor and definitely it's true no matter what our inclination are if we start earning more our consumption becomes like that if we don't have money we're gonna cut short on consumption this is quite quite obvious this is the human tendency 
all right so this is our consumption function we have to just memorize this consumption is equal to a plus b y d a stands for intercept that is a constant term even if income is zero we still be consuming something right for example we are unemployed and we have absolutely no income and still we are consuming a lot of goods and services and how we are consuming so we're gonna be drawing the income from the our past saving okay so income zero still there's gonna be something some consumption this is what a is for the y d stands for disposable disposable income income that is pay, left after paying taxes okay so b is the marginal propensity to consume what does it mean it means out of given income how much we're gonna be using for consumption we are not going into the detail of like marginal and average let's just talk about propensity to consume so let's say we have income of rupees 100 and we are using 25 percent for our consumption i mean definitely we just don't go on consuming our entire money right we just don't want spending entire salary into buying goods and services no we out to save something so propensity to consume is a proportion of the disposable income when we'll go into the graphical determination this thing become more clear further value of a is equal more than zero again so simple it cannot be zero right we can just be having zero consumption when income is zero no we always gonna be consuming something right and the value of b is greater than zero but less than one if value of b is one it simply means that whatever is the disposable income we're gonna be using that the using the entire income into consumption only but definitely this is not the case and if b is zero it simply means that we just are not using any of the income into consumption which again is not true so the value of b is something which is greater than zero and less than one all right again marginal propensity to consume is what changes in consumption due to changes in income for example our income has gone up from 1000 rupees to 1000 rupees and our consumption has gone up from rupees 50 to 100 so what is the change in consumption it is of rupees 50 and what is the change in income it's of rupees 100 so 15 upon 100 we get our marginal propensity to consume all right and this is the graphical explanation of the keynesian consumption function a is the intercept because it's the position of consumption curve when income is zero so why onto the x-axis we have disposable income so definitely at this particular point this is zero and a is that turns out to be our intercept and further onto the y-axis we have the consumption need and see this is the slope of the consumption curve which is equal to b so slope is a marginal propensity to consume that is how we calculate a slope we calculate a slope by dividing the changes in y to changes in x so changes in y here means change in, in consumption and changes in disposable income we get the marginal propensity to consume or the slope of the consumption curve if let's say marginal propensity to consume is quite high so with the given change in income they're going to be very high change in the consumption demand and we're going to be seeing this curve not like this but rather like this quite steep but if marginal propensity to consume is less we're going to be seeing the shape of this curve as very flat like this very slow changes into the consumption when the disposable income changes so what is the conclusion that yes b that is marginal propensity to consume is the slope of consumption curve all right what is the marginal propensity to consume it is the increase in consumption per unit increase in the disposable income that is change in, in changes in consumption divided by changes in income further we just have understood what these entire things are that income is equal to consumption plus saving plus taxes instead of income we have to write what disposable income and how we're going to get disposable income by subtracting the taxes from the income so tax comes to left side we get y minus t which is equal to c plus s so y minus t becomes disposable income all right further we can write this into we can come at a saving function also saving again is a function of income but we're gonna be having a little bit different shape of saving curve and different equation per se because when income is zero we cannot have a positive saving right rather we'll have a negative saving because the income is used either way there is no income and whatever savings are they are drawn to come 
they are drawn to do what they are drawn to be utilized for our present consumption so the saving at the zero level of income becomes negative all right and further this is 1 minus b b stands for marginal propensity to consume and 1 minus b becomes marginal propensity to save i mean it's a simple income is either consumed or saved and if we know what is consumed then the difference of left out the different i think i just am explaining the entire thing in one go so um, a lot of <laughs> all right so let's just again understand this thing without any pause okay so income is either consumed or saved all right and if we know what is saved then the difference will be consumed and if we know what is consumed then the difference would be saved so b is our marginal propensity to consume and if we subtract the marginal propensity to consume from 1 we will get marginal propensity to save and again it is also out of our disposable income only what is marginal propensity to save it is changes in saving due to changes in disposable income and this is our saving function all right why is the value of a negative this again author has explained that when disposable income will be zero then what shall be the saving saving again is the whatever is left out after consuming so zero disposable income consumption at zero disposable income is a and zero minus a we get minus a so this is our saving at the zero level of income all right further this is the graphical representation of the saving function so minus a is here that's how we get the intercept of saving curve which is of course towards the negative side and this is the slope that is 1 minus b or marginal propensity to slope to save just like in consumption function the marginal propensity to consume is our con slope of consumption curve similarly marginal propensity to save is our slope of saving curve all right and this is it further higher wealth again there are certain things that author has explained that we have just assumed that disposable income is something that's going to determine the level of consumption in the economy but this might not be true under all circumstances because intuitively also we know that this is not something that every individual associate itself with sometimes people definitely acknowledge the wealth also like people if are wealthy even if their current income has fallen they still would be into buying more goods and services because otherwise they have high wealth and also it's not just the current income people base their saving and consumption demand into they also acknowledge their permanent income also for example if today we start earning 5000 rupee per month it does not mean we're going to just base consumption on to the monthly income no we're going to be acknowledging that all right we'll be earning this 5000 for 2 years and how i'm going to spread out my consumption so current income is not the only factor that determine the level of consumption something called current plus future plus expected income that turns out to be a permanent income all these factors determine an ultimate impact on the consumption but again these are just for the sake of explaining we have to build a model and we have to make certain assumption and our assumption here is that yes broadly current level of income disposable income have a dominant impact on to the consumption and investment on to the consumption and saving not an investment i'm so sorry right only consumption and saving that's it now let's just talk about the investment demand so consumption was primarily induced expenditure and what is an induced expenditure that is directly related to income so higher the income higher will be the consumption this is pretty much pretty much simple but investment demand is independent now we have to understand few things here classical investment demand is determined by how by again determination is there that how much private entrepreneur is willing to demand investment 
it depends upon what is the rate of interest higher the rate of interest lower will be the investment demand again rate of interest is something which is determined by the investment demand per se and the supply of loanable funds so investment demand is the demand for loanable funds and supply of loanable funds and it's going to determine the rate of interest and classical notion is also like this keynesian notion is also like this that yes there is an impact on investment of rate of interest it is higher the rate of interest lower will be the investment but what determines the rate of interest there the classical and keynesian part ways in the classical system rate of interest is determined by real factors that is productivity thrift investment means productivity and thrift means saving so higher the saving lower will be the rate of interest higher the investment demand higher will be the rate of interest and we know how come this is going to be so because we have in the last chapter dealt with this thing extensively all right but keynesian system in the keynesian economics the determination of rate of interest in a very very different manner it's in in the form of demand for money and the supply of money and we'll look into this when we will study chapter number 6 when we will talk about the money market and determination of rate of interest in the keynesian economics so what we have understood here is that yes no matter how interest rate is determined classical and keynesian differ on the determination of interest rate rate per se but once the rate of interest has been determined then its impact on investment is something on which there is a consensus between classical and keynesian that yes rate of interest is inversely related to investment or rather investment is inversely related to rate of interest all right now keynesian stated that autonomous component aggregate demand which is independent of current income it causes income to vary autonomous component is what of course the private entrepreneurs investment demand because it is dependent upon the rate of interest and not on the income it is quite quite erratic okay because whenever expected profitability shifts investment demands gonna shift so investment demand is a component of aggregate demand in the keynesian economics we are leaving the classical economics now we are just talking about the keynesian economics only and the aggregate demand is extremely important in the keynesian economics is just to explain the consensus on to one thing which keynesian and classical have that i have brought in the classical notion here but now we are ending the classical system this is it let's just talk about the keynesian economics only so autonomous component of aggregate demand that is private investment demand this is quite erratic because profitability expectation of business entrepreneur is something which keeps on shifting and with the shift we're going to be seeing a shift in the aggregate demand and with the shift in aggregate demand definitely we're going to be seeing the change in the equilibrium level of output and employment a deviation from the full employment level of equilibrium output okay so keynes is of the view that since investment spending is volatile so government has to intervene i mean of course we know that total or aggregate demand is equal to consumption demand which is quite stable plus investment demand which is quite volatile quite unstable plus government spending so if i is volatile we just need to check that volatility by infusing the government investment by undertaking government investment so volatility gets cancelled out e for i falls let's just increase the g i goes up let's just decrease the g this is how we're going to be maintaining the overall aggregate demand all right keen stated that primary determinants of investment expenditure in the short run the interest rate and the state of business expectation now the business expectations that vary considerably and this is why the investment spending they are quite volatile what impact the rate of interest going to have on investment on this keen's analysis did not differ from the classical as i have already explained further 
what is the summary whatever we have studied we can encapsulate into this statement that expectations of the future profitability of investment projects rested on a precarious precarious means very fragile very uneasy base of knowledge like people don't really have much of knowledge their knowledge base is very very fragile either way sometimes you're gonna just be acting in like an animal spirit like everything is good and sometimes unnecessarily they're gonna be just showing very depressing symptoms so this is why the investment demand is quite volatile because it's not based on something sound logical facts it's quite based on precarious base the keens felt that such expectation could shift frequently definitely so at times drastically so shifting is there but sometimes the shift is so so drastic that the fall in aggregate demand is huge and this is what exactly happened in the year 1930 so that is how we saw high level of unemployment so in response to this the what this is it so consequently investment demand was unstable so government has to intervene to compensate for the deficiency in the aggregate demand that happens due to fall in the investment demand <coughs> all right now we are on to i mean how much is left now we are on to determination of equilibrium income all right सो डेफिनेटली अगेन इतना जो भी हमने समझा है वो इसी लिए समझा है ताकि हम लोग आसानी से इक्लेब्रियम लेवल ऑफ इनकम डिटर्मिन कर सकें बार बार उन्हीं चीज़ों को ना एक्सप्लेन करना पड़े ओके सो आई विल नॉट बी गोइंग इन टू अगेन वट दीज टर्मिनोलॉजीज आर विल जस्ट गोना स्ट्रिक टू द लॉजिक दैट यस एग्रीगेट डिमांड गोना बी इक्वल टू एग्रीगेट सप्लाई एंड दिस इज़ वन वी गोना बी हैविंग अ इक्लेब्रियम लेवल ऑफ इनकम राइट इंटायर लॉजिक ऑफ रियलाइज इन्वेस्टमेंट डिजायर इन्वेस्टमेंट वी हैव अंडरस्टूड दिस ऑलरेडी further author is saying that equilibrium income is an endogenous variable to be determined because definitely we know what endogenous and exogenous variable are endogenous variables are something that are what that are models output so income is model output we are using these variables these are all exogenous variable to determine the output level of income and this is our result so this is our endogenous variable and i and g which are autonomous expenditures they are what exogenous variable so if you don't know what these terminologies are then i have made a separate lecture on a dedicated video on what what ex exogenous and endogenous variables are because sometimes if we don't know these things now we just end up using them interchangeably endogenous ke jagah exogenous likh dete hain aur exogenous ke jagah endogenous to wo bahut zyada galat dikhta hai galat hota bhi hai aur entire meaning badal jata hai right so these things have to be very very clear so do watch that video either we have explained endogenous variable is something that is models output okay so definitely equilibrium income is our models output right exogenous exogenous variable is something that is models input that is coming outside of the model and that are independent so again in the investment and government they are independent they are independent to many things no matter what the level of income is we're going to be having certain level of investment and the government spending so these are all exogenous variable all right so instead of c we can write this that is a plus b plus y d why we can write this we know because this is our consumption function again instead of y d we can write y minus t i mean you can mathematically directly instead of directly jumping into this equation we can put one more equation here that c is equal to a plus b in the bracket y minus t y is the total income minus taxes will get disposable income since b is towards the outside of bracket into the bracket we have y minus t when we open the bracket it becomes b y minus p t okay a plus b y minus p t we're going to put that very consumption function into our equation here so y is equal to instead of c we're going to be writing this a plus b y minus p t plus i plus g all right we're going to just we're going to be just solving this very very easy so this b y that is on to our right side it becomes it comes on to our left side so it becomes y minus b y which is equal to what is the left over a minus b t plus i plus g y is taken out as common variable it whatever is left is this is bracket here so y has been taken out 1 minus b equal to again we're going to be writing this now 
इनकम रिमेन्स ऑन टू द लेफ्ट साइड वन माइनस बी कम्स ऑन टू द राइट साइड सिंस इट्स अ मल्टीप्लीकेटिव थिंग हेयर इट्स गोना गो डाउन एज अ डिवाइडिंग फैक्टर सो वन माइनस वन माइ वन अपॉन वन माइनस बी इज अगेन वी कैन बी राइटिंग दीज वेरी वेरिएबल्स दैट इज ए माइनस बी टी प्लस आई प्लस जी ऑल राइट सो वी कैन बी ड्रॉइंग दीज थिंग्स ऑन टू अ ग्राफ नाउ सो डेफिनेटली दिस इज आर फोर्टी फाइव डिग्री लाइन दैट स्प्लिट्स अ ग्राफ इन टू टू इक्वल पोर्शन एंड ऑन टू द ईच एंड एवरी लाइन ऑफ दिस ग्राफ वील बी सींग वाई एक्सिस वैल्यूज इक्वल टू एक्स एक्सिस वैल्यू सो दिस इज एक्स एक्सिस हेयर एंड दिस इज वाई एक्सिस हेयर वाई स्टैंड फॉर नॉट एक्सिस बट इनकम सो वाई मीन्स इनकम सो ऑन टू द फोर्टी फाइव डिग्री लाइन वी हैव एग्रीगेट डिमांड विच इज ऑन द वाई एक्सिस इक्वल टू एग्रीगेट सप्लाई विच इज ऑन टू द एक्स एक्सिस एंड अगेन दिस इज आर कंजम्पन फंक्शन विच इज द वॉट फंक्शन ऑफ द डिस्पोजेबल इनकम एंड इट्स स्लोप इज इक्वल टू द मार्जिनल प्रेंसिटी टू कंज्यूम एंड दिस इज आर इंटरसेप्ट दीज आर ऑल द autonomous component a is autonomous because income level is zero still will be consuming something taxes again are autonomous and we're going to be going to the details of taxes in g i think okay i just missed out this very component so government spendings are there and we just know that these are autonomous government has to undertake certain expenditure government has to build roads government has to undertake purchase of equipments machinery even if it's making losses something even if it doesn't have income so government spending is definitely autonomous further taxes are also autonomous it's just our assumption that all right government spending and taxes they are autonomous all right and why we are not writing t only why we are writing b with t because not entire taxable amount forms part of our aggregate demand no only that part is our aggregate demand which is used into consumption let's just understand with patience with the help of an example number 1 what we have to understand is that we are writing minus here it means this is not a positive function it's a negative function higher the taxes rate lower gonna be aggregate demand okay it's a leakage is from the system so let's say our income is 100 and we are paying 50 as taxes and 50 is consumption demand is there now government has done what it has increased the taxes if government has increased the taxes let's say from 100 to 200 so what shall be the decline in aggregate demand to the tune of entire rupees 100 or what not to the tune of entire rupees 100 why because either way 100 was not our consumption demand even if rupees 100 was our income it was not part of aggregate demand in its entirety because we were using only 50% of it for consumption so only a fraction of it is taken out of the system the fraction which is used in the consumption okay so the part in fact which is not used into the consumption if government is taking it away it doesn't make any difference it does actually but in a very positive way but we'll talk about it when we'll understand the ba balanced budget multiplier right now just understand that the t is not in its entirety taken into consideration a proportion of t is taken into consideration and that proportion is the marginal propensity to consume all right i think i have explained enough either way you just have to read froyan and you haven't got over these concepts you can mention it in the comment section i'll try to explain this in a more easy manner okay right so i plus g are again autonomous component because they are autonomous they're going to be a fixed increment into the consumption curve and we're going to be seeing a upward shifting in this curve that's it quite simple these are not dependent on to the income per se all right so our equilibrium is at the point here that is a so y had y bar going to be our equilibrium level of output on to the lower side also we can show this through investment and government spending that are injections and saving plus taxes that are leakages format so definitely saving curve is something which starts from the negative side because at the zero level of income our savings are negative so these are taxes are also 
autonomous definitely taxes are autonomous but they worry with the income for example tax rate is 2% so if income is 100 tax revenue will be rupees 2 if income is 200 tax revenue will be rupees 4 so tax imposition per se is something which is autonomous but tax revenue varies with the income all right this is our saving plus tax curve and this is our investment plus government spending curve which is quite autonomous as it's a horizontal line and their intersection going to determine the equilibrium level of income you can show this either way but more acceptable is this very point and we can show it in both ways also right now we are on to this last thing and this is we have already studied what this is but we're gonna be naming it now so this component is the autonomous expenditure multiplier again this is simply multiplier we know one upon marginal propensity to consume is a multiplier but we're gonna be calling it autonomous expenditure multiplier why so because it is multiplying multiplying what multiplying autonomous expenditure each and every variable here is autonomous it is independent of the level of income and we have understood this thing already investment demand is dependent upon the rate of interest and the expected profitability and not on the income government spendings are again something which is not determined by the level of income in the economy even if government is making losses even if the gdp or gdp simply means national income is quite low government still gonna be undertaking certain investments so it is quite autonomous of the income so these are all autonomous expenditure and this is our autonomous expenditure multiplier and whatever is the value income gonna change by a multiple of that very value all right so let's say margin propensity to consume is 0.5 and we're gonna be using b's value here and we'll see that the multiply value is gonna be 2 so 2 multiplied by whatever changes are brought into the autonomous expenditure let's say autonomous government expenditure changes to the tune of 100 crore so 100 crore multiplied by 2 invest the equilibrium level of income gonna change by 200 rupees crore okay so this is it i have just highlighted these things so that you can read them if you want but otherwise also i have explained and this is the crux of whatever we have studied up till now nothing new let's just with patience read it once okay Keynes theory in its simplest form can be stated as follows consumption is a stable function of income that is marginal propensity to consume is stable changes in income come primarily from changes in the autonomous components of aggregate demand especially from changes in the unstable investment component a given change in an autonomous component of aggregate demand causes a larger change in equilibrium income because of multiplier for reasons we explain later all right Equations that we've already studied make it clear that in the absence of government policies to stabilize the economy, income will be unstable because of unstability of the investment. And further, one can also see that by appropriate changes in the government spending and taxes, the government could counteract the effects of shift in investment. Appropriate changes in government and T, that is government spendings and taxes, could keep the sum of the terms in the parentheses in the brackets unchanged. So, if investment falls, we'll see this in our next lecture when we'll talk about the this thing changes in equilibrium income that how come when investment falls government can counteract that fall in investment by raising the government spending but we'll see this in, this in our next video friends so this is it we have almost done half of the chapter half chapter is left and we'll do it tomorrow and thank you so much for watching the lecture if you think that you haven't got anything then you can mention it in the comment section and i'll try to explain it with more patient and more detailed manner right so thank you so much for watching goodbye